thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's lift our hands to the Almighty God and bless His holy name. Worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Bless Him. Give Him glory. Give Him honor. Give Him adoration. Bless His holy name. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Give Him glory, give Him honor, give Him adoration. Bless the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Worship Him, worship Him. Give Him glory, give Him glory. Give Him honor, give Him adoration. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship. I am confident that there is someone here tonight who will never weep again. Now, if you are that one, for the next two, three minutes, praise God in such a manner that you will notice that you are the one. Go ahead, praise the Almighty God. Give Him glory. Praise Him. Until he will notice that you are the one who will never know sorrow again. Praise him. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worship. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worship. Praise Him, praise Him. King of glory, praise Him. Praise Jehovah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Praise Him, praise Him. King of glory, praise Him. Praise Jehovah, hallelujah, amen. I will praise Him, King of glory, praise Him. Praise Jehovah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Praise Him, praise Him, the King of glory, praise Him. Praise Jehovah, hallelujah, amen. Let us praise Him, King of glory, praise Him. Praise Jehovah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Praise 
Father, we worship you. King of glory, we adore you. The Lord of joy, we bless your holy name. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for what you did yesterday. Thank you for what you're about to do now. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. In your own miraculous way, my Father and my God, in all our lives, banish sorrow completely. From today onward, let us know nothing but joy. And then in your own miraculous way, with your everlasting arms, rescue all those who are in the Mary clay. Put everyone on the rock to stay. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. Why well, I shake hands with one or two people and tell them God will do something new in my life today. God bless you. You may please be seated. Tomorrow, by the special grace of God, is the day for healing. And God is going to be curing the incurable tomorrow. Tonight, we are going to be sharing from Psalm 40, from verse 1 to 3. Psalm 40, from verse 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. God is going to hear the cry of someone tonight. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Tonight we're talking on from Mary Clay to the rock to stay. Tonight will be different from any night you've ever seen before. Our salmon is going to be broken into two small pieces. But one, we will be talking to those who are in the merry clay and then give them an opportunity to come to the rock. So, halfway through the salmon. There will be an altar call so that those who are in the merry clay and want to trans to be transpositioned to the rock, we we'll give them an opportunity to give their lives to Jesus. After we've done that, we will have a second little sermon to talk to those who are already on the rock. You see, when you get married, 
when you make a vow of marriage, there are two significant sections in that vow. When you say, I take this woman to be my lawful wedded wife, you make a promise that is twofold. To have and to hold. Tonight, our topic is twofold. One is to be repositioned from the merry clay onto the rock. The second session is to stay. And to stay is <laughs> more crucial than to be repositioned to the rock. So, session one will be an outreach to those who are in the Mary Clay, and we will explain that in a moment. Session two is going to be a Bible study where we'll be digging deep a little. And after that, we will be allowed to pray. And tonight, when it is time to pray, I will pray for you first, like I did yesterday. And then you'll be asked to go and pray. And nobody will stop you when you get to that second session. You'll be allowed to pray for as long as you want. Now, part one. I think you need to stretch your hands towards me and say, Father, help your son. <laughs> Please pray that prayer loud and clear. <laughs> From the very beginning of the world, there have been two major forces in operation. darkness and light. In Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4, Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4, Bible made it clear that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then the Spirit of God moved, as he's going to do again here tonight. And God spoke and said, let there be light. And immediately there was light. In that very, very first day, God separated between darkness and light. And today, in the name that's above every other name, God is going to reposition someone from darkness to light. Now, living in darkness is compared to living in a merry clay. Uh, Mary Clay, in modern language, we could call it quicksand. You no, know, certain part of the of the world they have what they call quicksand. If somebody finds himself in quicksand. The harder he tries to get out, the deeper he goes. Mary Clay. Passage we I call it terrible pit. 
Now, how do we know whether or not we are living in a Mary clay? I will explain so that you can make up your mind to know whether you are living in a Mary clay or not. One of the greatest evidence of living in a Mary clay is traveling, walking hard, struggling hard without progress. In fact, instead of progress, like in a quick sign, the more you struggle, the deeper you go. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, the Bible describes it for us. It talks of people who keep on struggling only to give this thing to people who please God. They struggle and they have nothing to show for it. On the surface, they are doing well. But deep within, they know something is wrong. I remember when I was living in the Mary Clay. I was already a lecturer in the university. I had a car. But since I was uh, afraid of driving in Lagos, I had a driver. I would pay him his salary at the beginning of the month. By the middle of the month, I will be borrowing money from my driver to buy fuel. If you go to the University of Lagos and if they still keep those files <laughs> at the health center, my file was piled big. If I got sick and I got healed, then tomorrow it will be either my wife or one of the children. I was in the Mary Clay. I thought everybody thought I was doing great. Struggling with nothing to show for it is evidence number one that we are in the Mary Clay. Even if you are rich, quote and unquote, in the Mary Clay, the Bible says, with all your wealth, you won't be able to sleep. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 12. When you are in the Mary Clay, you may have money that you won't be able to sleep. The Bible tells us that if you are in the Mary clay, the reason you have this problem is because, according to Psalm 7 verse 11, Psalm 7 verse 11, you are living under the constant anger of God. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is angry daily with the wicked. And you can imagine a life where God is angry with you every day. If, if you are living in the Mary clay, as far as God is concerned, you are referred to as a dog. Matthew chapter 15 from verse 21 to 28. Matthew 15, 21 to 28. The Bible may declare there are two kinds of children, of, sorry, two kinds of creatures of God on earth. Dogs and children. 
If you are living in the Mary clay, according to Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, Revelation 22, verse 15, you are not cast. God regards you as somebody to be kept outside. And then there is one thing that is common to all those who are living in the Mary clay. They suffer from fear regularly, tormented by fear. First John chapter 4, verse 18. First John chapter 4, verse 18. Bible tells us fear has torments. That is why you find a lot of so called big people. Who surrender themselves with all manners of charms because they are afraid that somebody sooner or later will want to attack. But there is the other side those who live on the rock. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, Proverbs 10, verse 22, that God blesses them and add no sorrow. God will just bless them without sweat. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127 from verse 1 to 2, Psalm 127 from verse 1 to 2, the Bible says, God gives them sleep. He calls them beloved. They sleep fine. The Bible tells us that if those who are on this side, on the rock, God does not call them dogs. He calls them children. John chapter 1, from verse 11 to 12. John 1, 11 to 12. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Romans 8, verse 15, it tells us that these people, they know no fear. Because they know that they are children of the Most High God. They know God will take care of His own. Now, those in the Mary clay, like I've said earlier, on, the example that the drunkard drinks to drown his sorrow. He's not, he's not happy. So he wants to drown the sorrow. Then he goes and gets drunk. And then he, as he's getting a little sober, he says, ah, don't worry, I will drink again. The drunkard keeps getting drunk. Oh, you find that the one in the Mary Clay, from time to time, he will realize, my life is not what it should be. Things are not okay. Uh, and then the new year will come, and he will make what they call new year resolutions. In the new year, I won't do this anymore. I won't, so I won't smoke anymore. I won't lie anymore. I won't cheat anymore. And, and within one week, they break all the resolutions. It's not their fault. They couldn't help themselves. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, 2 Peter 2, verse 22, the Bible says, uh, even if a dog vomits, if a dog feeds what is inside me is not good, and he vomits it, after some time, you say, hey, this is good food. But there is someone who can pull them out. Someone who can put you out of the merry clay and put you on the rock. 
According to Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, the Bible tells us that his hands are everlasting. He can sit down his throne in heaven and reach down that mighty hand, grab you, and bring you out. And he's going to do so tonight. That's what he did to me. Among academicians, those of us who thought that we were, we were brilliant, we talk all kinds of rubbish. After a bottle or two of beer, after we've discussed politics and economy, the next thing we discuss is Jesus. We continue to blaspheme him. He said, <laughs> that, that man, Jesus, is a very clever man. He says, you must not look at a woman. Don't look at any beautiful woman. But when the harlot came and began to wash his feet with tears and wipe it with the hair of her head, and then and somebody said, hey, why are you doing this to each other? Mind your own business. No, no. <laughs> I was in the married clay. But he pleased the Almighty God. One day, he stretched out his everlasting hand and grabbed me among all those noisy blasphemers. I said, you, you're coming to the rock. There is somebody here tonight. That same everlasting arm will reach out to you. <laughs> and pluck you out of the merry clay. He has the ability to pluck you out of that rubbish and wash you clean. First John chapter 1 verse 7. First John chapter 1 verse 7 tells me that his blood wipes away all sins. His, his, his blood cleanses from all sins. Because we see half part two, I don't have time to begin to tell you all the rubbish that I've ever done. But I was in the merry clay. When we lie, we, we, we say it with glee. I sat him down. Mokbejoko. We took pride in lying. When we, when, we, when we got drunk over the weekend, and we want to boast about it on Monday, we say, ah, yesterday was terrible. But today, I am on the rock. And there are some people in the merry clay that my God will want to reposition. And the invitation is open. You see, there is nobody that God has condemned into being in the merry clay. Occasionally, you hear some people say, I am living this lifestyle because God made me so. No, God never made anything evil. Everything he made was good. In fact, when he made you, he said, very good. But then he says, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy lady, and I will give you rest. It gives you a choice. 
He says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and come unto me and open the door, then I will come in. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can continue to live in the merry clay, continue to travel, continue to be afraid, continue to live in sorrow, or receive his invitation, and he will reposition you. It took me quite a while. When I had a problem, and the problem brought me finally to the redeemed Christian Church of God, <laughs> in a church that was made with both of, I looked at the church, I looked at the name, the redeemed Christian Church of God, I said, ah, big name. Big name kills the small dog. I got there, they preached, and they they were telling me, forsake your sin. I said, what do they know about sin? Oh, I made mean, just habits. But one day, my day came. And I realized these people, these people that I was, call, I was calling illiterate, I was the most educated among them there. And when you look at their faces, you can see the peace of God. There was a storm raging in my own heart. I saw the difference was clear. And something said to me, they're not asking you to surrender to their church. They're asking you to surrender to your maker. With all your degrees, how far have you gone? That day I heard his voice. That day I surrendered. That day everything changed. And so tonight, before I go to the second part, any one of you who you know you are, you are, you are in the merry clay, you are traveling, you are in sorrow, you are in fear, when you think you are enjoying, you yourself will say, ah, yesterday was bad. If it is you that God is talking to, then know very well he says in his word, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. So I'm going to count from one to ten. If you want to cross over from the mighty clay to the rock, before I count ten, come and stand before this altar, and I will pray for your salvation. And the one who saved my soul, he said, I'm waiting to save your own soul today. And I'm counting now. One. Two. Unto yourself be true. Oh, the fact that you are attending church does not mean that you are born again. If you are not in true relationship with Jesus Christ, you can be in the church for hundreds of years. It won't make a difference. But you want to leave the merry clay. You want to come to the rock. Hurry up now. Three. Four. Oh, if a man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All oh, things are passing away, all things become new. Are you sure everything became new when you gave your life to Jesus? When you said you gave your life to Jesus. If you have not changed dramatically, so dramatically that even your friends won't be able to recognize you, you better come for genuine salvation. Five. Six. 
six. Seven. And as we come, begin to cry unto him, Lord, please save my soul. Reposition me from the merry clay. I want to be on the rock. I want to be your child. I want to be one of yours, Lord. I don't want to remain a dog. Father, save my soul. Eight. Nine. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Keep coming, keep coming. And pray as you come. Asking Jesus to be merciful unto you. Save your soul tonight. Reposition you from the merry clay. Put your feet on the rock. Nine. And if you are coming, just keep coming, keep coming. Uh, and keep praying as you come. Now those of us who are in front, cry to the Almighty God, please Lord, save my soul. I want you to reposition me from Mary Clear, I want to be on the rock. Pray, call on him now. Call on him. And the rest of us, please stretch your hands towards these people and intercede for them. Pray that the Almighty God will have mercy on them and save their souls. Pray that today will mark a new beginning, even as they are moved from the merry clay onto a life on the rock. Stretch your hands to them and pray for them. Those of you on the way, keep coming and pray as you come. Thank you. Don't push them back, don't push them back, let them come. If they want to come to pray, let them come, please. Don't stop them. Nobody is too young to be saved. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Savior, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for today being a great day of salvation for many people. Particularly for those who are here and for those who are watching all over the world. Please save their souls, O oh Lord. Amen. And reposition them from the merry clay, Lord. Put them on the rock right now. Amen. And Lord God Almighty, let them stay with you forever. Amen. When they cry to you now, Father, please answer them. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Now I, I rejoice with those of you who have come forward. From now on, by the grace of God, I'll be praying for you. Uh, counselors, I want you to please come here and attend to them here. Counselors, please come. The counselors are coming. They will collect your names, your address, and your prayer requests. And they will pass it on to me, and I promise you, I'll be praying for you from now on. We will wait for you till the counselors are finished with you before we go to the next session. Because by the grace of God, you're on the rock now. Amen. Congratulations. All right, so you hold on. The counselors are coming. They will attend to you in a moment.
Glory be to God. Softly, very softly, music, please.
who believe they are now on the rock. Let me hear you shout hallelujah. Uh, incidentally, they, they just brought me the maternity report. Uh, since the Congress started yesterday to 7 p.m. this evening, Seven children have been born. <laughs> Six boys and one girl. <laughs> so let the boys shout praise the Lord. And let the girls shout hallelujah. Now we've come to part two. Now I want you to fasten your seat belt. There's nothing as bad as being called ex rich, ex successful. X powerful. It's better never to have been on the rock than to go back to the merry clay. 
So I pray for every one of you in the name that's above every other name. You will never go back. Let me remind you of the advantages of being on the rock because he wants to reposition us out of the merry clay onto the rock to stay. When you are staying on the rock, your future is secured. In Matthew chapter 7, from verse 24 to 27, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, the Bible tells us, the Lord says, if you hear my word, and you obey them, you'll be like somebody who has built his house on the rock. It doesn't matter what storm may come, the house will stand. In the name that's above every other name, everything you have achieved in life will last. But the one who builds on sand, you know what's going to happen. It's one thing to be successful now. It's another thing to succeed forever. When you are brought on the rock, stay. Because according to Luke chapter 20 from verse 17 to 18, Luke 20, 17 to 18, the Bible may declare, you are built on the rock, you are on the rock to stay, you become impregnable. Anybody falls on you, that fellow will be broken. You fall on any enemy, that enemy will become Ordinary sand. That's what the Bible says. But you see, the devil, who, who is the king of the Mary Clay, is a very mischievous fellow. Moment to escape, he would do everything he can to bring you back. That it will fail in Jesus' name. There are many people all over the world now telling you that once you are saved, you are saved forever. Of course, you can be saved forever, provided. You take heed. That's what the Bible says. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. First Corinthians 10, verse 12 says, If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Ah, the Almighty God who has kept me standing till now will keep you standing forever. There are so many preachers now all over the world telling you that you, since you are saved by grace, which is true, that you can now do whatever you like, that you will see make you to heaven. They say that people like me who tells you to take heed, they say we have not studied Paul. 
So I want to talk to you tonight. Serious talk. Father to children. Because whether the devil likes it or not, because of what you are going to hear tonight and what we are going to do tonight, I will see you in heaven. They said, uh, people like me, we didn't study Paul. Ah. I studied Paul. Because when I became born again, I studied certain characters in the Bible, people I want to be like. I studied Elijah because I wanted power. Hey, that man could pray and fire will fall. I studied Elijah for three solid years. Private study. I studied Elisha. And one of the people I studied was Paul. Why? Number one, Paul was an academician. And I'm coming from the academic world. He has a PhD in law. There's a lot of relationship between law and mathematics. We deal in logic. And then it's written about him. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Verses 11 and 12, Acts 19, 11 and 12. The God performed special miracles by the hands of Paul. That from his body, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken to the sick. And the sick deceased, disparted from them, demons departed. I said, uh -huh. I'm going to be like this boy. I determined when I was a very young Christian. By the time I leave this world, it will be recorded. God performed special miracles by the hands of Adeboye so that from his body, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken to the sick and they were all healed. And I thank God by now. <laughs> Only God knows how many testimonies. So I studied Paul more than these people who begin to tell us that if I had studied Paul, I would have known that he's an apostle of grace and therefore I wouldn't be talking what I'm talking. I studied Paul. And so I'm going to talk to you from what Paul, the one they claim as their source, from what Paul said. I won't even touch any other apostle. Apostle Paul had tasted both sides, the Mary clay and the rock. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 12 to 15, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15, he calls himself the chief of sinners. I could relate to that. And I, when I was studying him, I said, God, I thank you. I have been a very naughty boy, but I wasn't as bad as Paul. I wasn't as bad as all of Tassos. So if you could use... Saul of Tassos, yeah, you can use me. And then when he got on the rock, he moved so fast on the rock that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5, he could say boldly, I'm a chief among the apostles. Please listen to me, my children. This is a very, very special night. I'm not here to boast. You know me very well. 
that by the special grace of God, anywhere in the world today, when they are mentioning people they call apostles, I think they will mention my name. I studied Paul because I wanted to become like him. And he is the one who said, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. He says, <laughs> you want to stay on the rock? Keep your body under subjection. That's what Paul says. You can't claim that you are born again and then continue to do whatever your flesh wants to do. No way. Oh, they tell me, Jesus paid it all. I agree. Uh -uh. But the same Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, from verse 1 to 2, Romans 12, 1 to 2, he said, you have to present your body a living sacrifice to God. You are, uh -uh. <laughs> you are now on the rock. No more rottenness. Do I hear you say Amen. The same Apostle Paul warned us in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 14 to 31. Please read it. Write it down and read when you get home. Ephesians 4 from verse 14 to 31. He said, hey, beware of every wind of doctrine. All manners of doctrines now going around to deceive to recapture for the devil those whom God had already saved. Can you ever believe that a preacher can stand up on the pulpit and tell the congregation that the greatest problems in the Bible are Moses and Elijah? Moses and Elijah? They were problematic? Oh, <laughs> you are the only two people who came to talk to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you call those people problematic? It is Paul who said in Romans chapter 6 from verse 1 to 2. Romans 6, 1 to 2. He said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What was the answer? Don't let anybody deceive you. Uh -uh. Anybody who tells you that once you are born again, you can continue to lie that it doesn't matter. You can continue to cheat, that it doesn't matter. That you can continue to fornicate, that it doesn't matter. It's an agent of the devil. Quote me. Because in heaven, no unclean thing will be allowed in. The God we serve, my God, it's a holy God. The angels are always crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That same God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The same Paul, the same Paul, says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 22 to 25 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 22 to 25 he, he, he advises particularly you 
youth. He said, flee. Flee youthful loss. You know the meaning of flee? It's run as in terror. Run as if the devil is pursuing you. The devil has sent preachers into the world to see how many youth they can gather back into the kingdom of hell. As the Lord lives who sent me, they won't get any of my children. No, no, they won't. Because I will tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Paul is the one talking. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, he said, <laughs> The foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his soul. And then he went on to say, If you name the name of Jesus, you must depart from iniquity. You think, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I speak in tongues, and then you can go ahead and begin to do yahoo yahoo, uh, you will go to hell. You want to make it to heaven. You want to stay on the rock. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15, Philippians 3, 13 to 15, he said, you must press on. Press on. Press on. Don't, re don't relax. The same Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, from verse 1 to 17, write it down. Colossians 3, 1 to 17, he has to say focus. Focus on things above, not on things beneath. There are certain things you are, you must never allow to come near you again. When you go through the scriptures, go to the last Bible, the, the, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, you will discover <laughs> that eight times, how many times? The Bible keep on saying, he that overcometh, he that overcometh, he that overcometh. Read Revelation chapter 2. Read Revelation chapter 3. Read Revelation chapter 21. You will find them there. Overcomers. God says, if you overcome, I will do this. If you overcome, I will do this. It means you have a fight on your hand. But in the name that's above every other name, you are going to win. <laughs> and you know what? The Bible says, the moment you cross over to the rock, There's a crown waiting for you in heaven. Oh, Paul said so. Read it. Second Timothy chapter 4 from verse 6 to 8. Second Timothy 4, 6 to 8. The same Paul. He said there's a crown waiting for those of us who love the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible now says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, 
Revelation 3 verse 11 says, hey, Hold fast that which you have. Let no man take your crown. Oh, when I see you in heaven, I will see you wearing your crown. <laughs> Let me close with this so that we will have time to pray because we want to do some serious praying tonight. Mm -hmm. So why am I saying all this? Well, I'm not only talking to those of you who are here. The whole world is here. The world has gotten so rotten. You can't believe it. So those of you who are on the rock, you need to hold fast. I, I heard from, some, from a source that things have gotten so bad that there is a nation now about to... Oh, make a law that makes it legal for a man to have sex with an animal. No, that's how bad it is. But whether the devil likes it or not, there will be a remnant. There will be those of us who will not be contaminated. There are those of us who will not backslide. If you are one of us, say amen loud and clear. Let me close with this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 16 to 24. First Thessalonians 5, from verse 16 to 24. There's one thing I want you to note there. And that is that the same Paul says, you have to pray without ceasing. Keep praying. Keep praying. Don't let the enemy drag you back to the merry clay. Keep praying. Remember I've told you earlier, he said, hey, if you think you stand, take heed so you don't fall. Keep praying. So your prayer points tonight, if you want to write them down. Number one, you're going to thank God and say thank you for bringing me from the merry clay onto the rock. That will be your first prayer. Thank you for bringing me from the merry clay onto the rock. Thank you for the salvation of my soul. Number two, you say, Father Almighty God, help me to stay on the rock. You brought me out of the merry clay to the rock. Now help me to stay on the rock. Number three, Lord God Almighty, don't let anybody take my crown. Don't let anybody take my crown. And finally, Lord, help me to end well. The Bible says, it is he who endures to the end that shall be saved. Let me end well. It's time to pray. The altar will be open after I've prayed for you. Come and seek the Lord tonight. Let's, let's bombard heaven with our requests so that not only are we going to be repositioned from Mary Clay to the rock, but we will be on the rock to stay and to stay forever. Shall we please stand? Ah, glory be to God. Raise your hands to heaven. Let the Almighty God, first of all, hear you shout hallelujah.
My Father, my God, I thank you for giving me the grace to deliver this message to your children. Thank you because it shows that you really, really love them. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my Father, my God, I'm committing this, your children, into your hands. You have brought us from the merry clay. You have planted our feet now on the rock. Help us to stay. There might be some of us who are proud, who think that nothing can shake us. Uh, my Father, my God, help us to stay. Almighty God, help us to stay. We have been kept by the power of God up to this moment. Father, keep us in the end. Let nobody take our crown. I pray that all your children here today will end very well. I decree in the name that's above every other name. Now from this moment onward, any time the tempter comes, the grace to say no to the devil, receive it in Jesus' name. Anytime, anything at all, whether in your place of work or even in your church, if anything at all is about to turn you back to hell, the grace to say no to the devil, receive it in Jesus' name. The Bible says, the last shall be first, and the first may be last. I pray in the name that's above every other name. Those of you who are already first, you will never be last. And I'm praying that the grace to pray, the grace to really, really cry to the Almighty God tonight, so that your position on the rock will be permanent. So that God might put a new song in your mouth. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. The choice is yours now. If you like, you can pray for five minutes and run away. God knows his own. But if you love yourself, after what you have had tonight, come and seek the face of the Lord. Pray vigorously. Pray that you will never, never, never backslide again. Pray that you will never fall. Go ahead. Begin to call on the Almighty God. We'll see you tomorrow in Jesus' name.